My father told me a story once. I'll never forget it, for a few reasons. I think it's the first story he ever told me, as a child. It's also the story of how my grandfather died. But honestly, that isn't the reason. You hear stories on TV, or sometimes you overhear something in a public place. People talk about ghosts, aliens, and you think to yourself, that isn't real. They're making it up, or they're mistaken, or they're crazy, or something like that. You just can't believe it, until something happens. Something that brings it all together, connects the dots in a way you didn't think of before. Maybe it happens to you. Maybe you hear it. Maybe you hear the same story again and again, happening to different people. It doesn't take long for the world to become a lot bigger than you thought it was. As I said, this is a story my father told me, but I never believed it. Even though he swore up and down, it was true. It wasn't until I started clicking around the internet, I started to believe. I started to hear other stories, just like the one my father told me. It didn't take me long to believe in the rake. That's not what my father called it, of course. He's never used the internet in his life. He wouldn't know of what the consensus has taken to naming it. When he chose to call it something other than it or that thing, he called it Skinwalker, after an old Cherokee tale his grandfather told him. But I'll tell you the story the way he told it to me. We were out hunting one night, he'd tell me. Coyotes, we'd kill them for 50 bucks a skin. They lived in a dairy farm in Ohio. They'd kill calves sometimes. We'd do it every night because we needed the money. Sometimes, while we were out, we'd come across a deer and kill it. Our landlord didn't mind, and it could feed our family for a few nights and save us some money. Anyway, we were done making our rounds and began heading home, walking, because we didn't have a car or some four-wheeler back then. We'd cut through the woods. That's when we came upon it. Blood everywhere, splattered on the trees, in the grass, in the creek, everywhere. At first, we figured it was a pack of coyotes. We'd seen it sometimes. They can't scavenge and start hunting a deer or cattle. The worst was when they bred with feral dogs. But this wasn't like that. See, when a pack of dogs or wolves or coyotes attack something, they do it right. They pick off the one that's weak or sick or old or just small. They hunt it, draw it into a corner, some place it can't get out of, and they'll run it right into the biggest one, the alpha. And that deer will never see the alpha. It might hear it, but it won't see it. It'll just notice that its throat's gone, and then it'll drop dead. It's quick and clean. That wasn't what happened here. Something had ran up on a den of deer. Coyotes won't attack a den, wolves neither, because they'd get too much of a fight. There were three, I think, three bodies, just torn apart. You'd see a head there, a leg there, a torso here. Predators don't do that. They don't leave behind scraps. What had done this hadn't done it for food. It had done it for fun. But we didn't know that. We saw a bunch of carcasses, and we think it's something we gotta take care of. I remember my dad telling me to go home. He thought it was a pack of feral dogs, but I wasn't leaving him, and I damn sure wasn't walking through two miles of woods alone, with nothing but a twenty-two and a pocket knife. He was thirteen at the time, so a twenty-two rifle was the only gun he could reliably use. Dad had a shotgun and I wasn't going anywhere without it. It took me a while to convince him, but finally we began tracking whatever did that. It wasn't hard either, we just followed the blood. Either that thing bled before it got away, or it dragged one for a mile. I don't know, I know I'd never seen my dad scared before that night. 
We started hearing noises. I've been in a lot of woods in my life. I've been all over the world, and I haven't ever heard noises like I heard that night. I heard things screaming. Heard deer, a fox, and rabbits, and a raccoon, and birds. Just scared. Keep in mind, this is maybe 12 or 1 o'clock. Except the fox and some birds. Nothing was supposed to be even awake. But they aren't just awake. They were moving. I saw flocks of birds just trying to get out of there. We came up on a pack of coyotes. Nearly shot a couple of them, thinking it was what we were looking for. But then we saw they were running towards us, then right past us. Didn't even notice. Then some deer did the same. Then some rabbits, squirrels, foxes, and even a couple wild hogs. These things were supposed to be eating each other, and the only thing they cared about was getting out of there. We should have put it together that maybe whatever we were tracking, it wasn't something we were supposed to see, and wasn't something we could kill. I don't know why we didn't just go home. I guess we were curious. I think that was my dad's nature, to go toward trouble, to fight. And knowing what I knew about what my father did during the war, my nature was to stay close to him. We finally get into an open valley. It was normally a soy field, but it wasn't in season, so it was just flat dirt. We saw the tracks. A lot of the animals fleeing the forest had paved over the land. But where that deer blood was, nothing had taken a single step, like they were leaving it for us to find. The tracks were shallow. Whatever it was couldn't have weighed more than a hundred pounds. But that didn't mean much. A bobcat weighing 40 pounds nearly tore out my damn throat once. All that means is it's quick and hard to hit. So we follow the tracks, and it doesn't take us long to find where it is. There's this old schoolhouse that sits on the top of the hill. Half of it had been ripped out by a tornado, but nobody lived there, not for a long time. We caught homeless people in there sometimes, or even druggies looking for a safe place to shoot up. We figured maybe that was it. Maybe it was some sick kid riding a high, but we didn't think that for long. We'd get within 50 yards, and we'd hear this noise, a scratching kind of sound. It was sort of made up of two different sounds. One was a high-pitched screech, another was a low-pitched growl. It was making both at the same time. We get within 20 yards and we hear the sound. I can remember thinking it sounded like paper being torn apart while someone was swishing water in a bucket back and forth. My dad looks at me, kneels down and whispers, I gotta stay behind him because we're about to corner him. Any animal will fight when it's cornered, especially if it's a predator. But we can tell by the tracks that it's just one. He tells me it's probably a single feral dog, most likely rabid. The plan is to sneak up on it while it's eating, shoot it, and then keep shooting it till it didn't move anymore, then slit its throat. And if it gets to dad, it's my job to shoot it or stab it to get it off of him. So he walks up and I'm right behind him, just a tad to his side so I can see what it is. I wish to this day that I hadn't. It was leaning over a carcass, tearing off its flesh, and throws what it doesn't nibble aside. There was blood all over the brick, glistening in the moonlight. It's pale white, human looking, but not quite human. It had arms and legs like a human, but it sat like a monkey, hunched over, and its hands weren't normal. It had long fingers with claws at the end. So we see that, and my dad hesitates. He wasn't about to fire on a person, so he clears his throat, trying to get it to turn around. I swear to God, all the noise just ceased. I haven't ever heard true silence before that, and not after it. But for two seconds, nothing, nothing made any noise which made it all the louder when it turned around and made this shrill cry and jumped on my dad. 
He got a shot off. I think he missed. If he hit the thing, it didn't mind. But it was on him. Tears parts of him off. I start shooting with my twenty-two point blank, but it barely bled. I got off five rounds, and then I started hitting it with the butt of the gun. It wasn't budging. It didn't even register that I was there. It's clawing at my dad, taking off bits of his flesh, and starts on his torso, ripping off skin, and then moves up. It tore off his throat, and then his nose, ripped off the bottom half of his jaw. I don't exactly remember what happened, but somehow my dad's knife ends up in the thing's shoulder, and my dad ends up on my back. I'm running, and by God I'm running faster than I have ever ran before, and it's following me. I end up back in the woods, opposite the ones we've been in. I'm heading towards my landlord's house, cause it's half a mile away. I can hear the thing screeching and moaning. I hear these tree branches crack and get thrown around. It sounds like someone's taking an axe to every single tree I pass. It's cracking so loud and often, but I just can't look back. Finally, I trip into gravel. I look up, and there's my landlord and a bunch of his buddies drinking around a campfire. I scream and I cry, and they come over. I'm telling them to call an ambulance. And he looks at me, and I'll never forget what he said. What's on your back? He asked me. Just as he said it, he saw one of those god-awful flannel shirts my dad wore everywhere. It was what was left of my dad. Suddenly we hear it, screeching. He grabs me and my dad gets thrown to the ground. I'm fighting him, crying, because I think we can still save him somehow. But my dad had been gone before I ever picked him up. He has to pick me up and throw me aside before I come with him. He and his buddies were all inside and locking their doors and getting guns. The landlord's asking me what happened, but I just don't know what to tell him. He pieced enough of it all together to understand that there was something dangerous there. All the lights in the house were on and someone called the cops. They'll be there, but in 15 minutes. We look outside and I see it walk in front of the fire they'd made. They don't know what it is. One of them says it looks like an ape. Suddenly, something goes through the window. We shoot at it, but it ain't the thing. It's my landlord's dog. Just the body though, not its head or legs. We start pushing things in front of the doors and windows when we hear something in the garage. I remember one of my friends saying the doors were open. We hear metal and glass just get ripped apart, but we put a couch and TV in front of the door to the garage. It banged around some more, but then it got quiet, not silent, like it was before. We could hear it move around some, and the guys were talking, making sure the guns were ready. Someone hands me a pistol. No sooner did I cock the hammer back, did we hear something shatter upstairs. Then we heard it screech again, except now it was louder, and it didn't echo and fade out, because it was inside. We all rushed to the one door leading upstairs, and we got to it just as that thing did. It opened it just a bit, and four or five men just slammed into it. It got its hand through, though. Someone with a shotgun took care of that. Put the barrel right up to its wrist and pulled the trigger. Cut its hand clean off. That only pissed it off, though. It started pushing on the door, clawing. We were on one side pushing as best as we could, and it was on the other side doing the same. The wood was just not going to hold. Someone tells us to keep our heads down. Then suddenly, the top half of the door is just gone. My ears ringing, and there are splinters everywhere. Two or three of them unloaded on the top of the door. I don't really know where it went after that. The police got there. I was still glued to the door, or what was left of it. The sun was up before they got me off it. They put me in the hospital for a while. A lot of the people talked to me, but I didn't talk back. Not for a long, long time. When I got back home, I got a job for the landlord, working on the farm. We didn't talk much, not about the thing, but I signed up for the army when I was 19, and he'd sat me down to drink some scotch as a send-off. I asked him right away what the police told him. The story they went with was a wild animal 
probably a wolf or maybe a bear that had migrated north. I asked him how could they say that when they had the hand. He looks at me stunned. He tells me the hand never made it back to the station. The cop who had it in his car wrecked into a tree and died on impact. The hand was never found, probably taken away by an animal. The cops, when they would acknowledge the hand existed at all, said it simply was the paw of a bear and it looked like a human hand. I never talked to the landlord again. He went missing when I was in basic, never found him. They say he owed some people money and just ran away, but I don't think it's that simple. I never went back to those woods. I wouldn't even if I had the whole US Army on my back. I don't think my father felt he had anything left and that he might as well settle old sores. He went into those woods. He never came back. The FBI was called. They did a show for everyone involved, but I knew they weren't really looking. I had to get one drunk and slip him a few fifties before he finally told me that they got a few calls about those woods every year about someone up and vanishing. But that was all he wanted to tell me. Before he got up and left with the rest of the team, he wrote, The Rake, onto a napkin. I didn't know what it meant until I searched for it on the internet. Honestly, I would have rather not known. Rewind two weeks. It's the 4th of July. A few of my friends want to actually do something instead of lounge around in front of our computers like we do every day. There were five of us, me, Neil, Elijah, JD, and Neil's sister, Katie. Neil had the idea to go to his grandparents' house as they owned a farmhouse. We live in Texas, so having that much space, especially with other houses being half a mile out, it was the perfect place to pop fireworks without getting into too much trouble. The drive from where we lived to their house was about a 40 mile drive. Unfortunately, the only car that we had at our hands was a two door, so trying to fit five of us into the car was hectic, to say the least. The drive was actually tolerable. Three of my friends were in the back and found a comfortable yet funny position to sit in the car. The music Katie was playing was helping a lot and definitely passed the time. We all bought some fireworks halfway there, and my friends jumped back into their designated position for another 20 miles. As we got there, Neil forgot to mention that his grandparents were out of town for the week, which made the experience ahead of us a lot better. All of us got out of the car except for Katie, who suggested that she get us all food and sodas for the night. She kept the fireworks in the back because she didn't want us popping any off while she was gone. She drove off and we were all left there without fireworks. So we did the next best thing, went to the pool in the back. Something that already put me off was that ranch sat considerably close to a forest. Neil even went the extra step to tell me that there's an occasional wolf that can be a hassle to deal with. Of course, I got nervous because I had nothing to defend myself with if one had jumped over the fence. He handed me a pocket knife, saying that there's a shotgun in the living room if something goes down. He mentioned that he was going to set up a game of risk for us all to play while Katie was out, as the drive to the closest market was well over a couple miles out. So, Elijah and I sat poolside telling stories to each other about stupid stuff that happened while we were in college. During our talk, I was staring out in the forest line, paranoid about the wolves that Neil teased me about. I saw something move. I couldn't tell since the porch light behind me was making it harder to see any details. But the way it moved made my heart jump. Elijah could see my body language as he leaned in to see what was there. He started to ask me what I saw, and I replied with a wolf on the tree line. He looked toward where I pointed, and he calmed down. That's just Katie, dude. I think she was trying to scare us. He started calling her name, waving his arm and laughing, saying how she scared the hell out of me. 
Neil came out of the house, wondering what Elijah was screaming about. Then he saw his sister standing in the field. He started to laugh when Elijah told him what happened and how I was on the edge of my seat. JD came out of the house next, and Neil told him to help Katie with the bags and grab the fireworks. Katie, who was out in the field, started to wave back, but the wave definitely seemed out of place. It wasn't so much waving, but a sudden jerk, like if you were trying to pop your elbow. Elijah yelled for Katie to come back so we can start the party, but JD came back with a terrified look on his face. Katie's not back yet. I just called her. She's still on the road towards Walmart. Their laughing stopped, and Elijah's face faded, and his arm fell into his lap with a thud. Everyone looked at the still-jerking figure in the field. Then, she screamed. The scream was so loud, it sounded like it may as well have been a couple feet away. All of us scrambled, running back into the house. Slamming the door behind us, Neil shouted for us to lock the doors and grab the shotgun in the living room. I ran to grab the shotgun, as it was the closest thing to us while the other two ran to each of the doors leading inside. Quickly, I grabbed the shotgun and stuffed a couple of shells in my pocket, running back to the kitchen where we came in from, and handed the shotgun to Neil. I pulled out the shells and sat them on the counter, and he loaded one in. JD came back nearly covered in sweat, freaking out and shouted, What the fuck was that? Just as scared as he was, I look at both of them. Elijah quickly joining us again. You don't think it was a skinwalker? I read stories I've been all over 4chan and creepypastas. JD tried to reassure us. No, it c can't be. That's Katie. I'm sure she's just trying to scare us. Cut the bullshit, JD. Neil barked at him. That scream wasn't human. You already called her. And you told us she was still going out. He turned back to the door, pushing the blind slightly. To find Katie closer to us. It stood at the gates of the pool, illuminated by the light and revealing that didn't look much like Katie at all. The hair was a mess and the clothes looked tattered. Her skin was bruised. The one thing that caught our eye most was her face. The head was tilted, like it struggled to support the weight. The eyes were blank with emotion, and the jaw was agape. It raised an arm jerking it like it did before in a mock wave. The jerking, however, started to get more violent as the entire body started to shake uncontrollably. Neil quickly closed the curtains and backed off. He orders us to sit behind the counter. He set himself in the gap leading into the kitchen with a gun aimed at the door. I was silent for what felt like an hour. The three of us continued to look at Neil who was completely focused on the door. A massive, grotesque smell entered our noses, and all of us reacted appropriately. The horrid stench was like if you left groceries to ferment in a box in the summer heat, with a couple of carcasses as a garnish. It was definitely hard to breathe, tasting the smell in the back of your throat, even with your nose pinched. It was so bad, JD actually threw up. Then, without any warning, the smell was gone. The hot air that was the smell went away, and was easier to breathe. I was afraid to let go of my nose, but was rewarded with a breath of fresh air. Everyone took a couple of breaths to rid their lungs of the pungent smell that lingered before. Neil asked us if we were okay and replied, JD being the exception since he'd puked. We heard what sounded like a whine. It sounded like a mix between a dog and a child about to cry. It was coming from the porch door, but from the front where we came in from the car. All of us stood up, Neil moving forward as we stayed back. We knelt down by the stairs, still hearing this whining. It didn't hit me until we positioned ourselves, but it sounded like something was trying to talk for the first time, like an animal, in a raspy, but still high-pitched voice, I could make out a very small portion of what it was trying to say. Gee, fuck. 
Hot. It kept repeating this, until it started to sound more enunciated, more human. What the fuck was that? It sounded like JD. Same accent, same speech pattern, same voice. JD started to shiver. His breath was getting shallow. He shouted back in a scared voice I'd never heard come from his mouth until now. Get out. Leave us alone. Get the fuck out. Leave us alone. Get out. The last words that we heard were in the same scream we heard when we saw it initially. It started to pound on the door. Not like it was trying to force itself in, but like an impatient knock. It started to scream in the same pitch we heard it when we initially saw it. Get out! Get out! Get out! It terrified all of us. The inhuman screams. The polite pounding on the door. I started crying. I thought this was it. Neil wasn't scared, like us. He was right pissed. He stood up storming towards the door, screaming. He swung open the door, pointing a shotgun at whatever was on the other side. Pulling the trigger filling all of our ears with the sound of a shotgun blast and the ringing to follow. Neil stood at the door, huffing. His body language was wanting to rip this thing apart. I stood up, looking past his arm, seeing nothing but a shell on the ground. I looked up past his shoulders, seeing nothing on the driveway and the road leading back to where we came. He turned around, the adrenaline fading away, and a shaky voice coming from his mouth. We're not staying here. JD, call Katie and tell her to get ready to go back home when she comes back. The rest of the time, all of us were in the kitchen. The shotgun sat on the counter with several shells near the butt of the gun. None of us wanted to say anything. None of us wanted to look at each other. It was nothing but silence until Katie called us. Neil quickly wrote a note, leaving it on the gun as we left. All of us hopped into the car, silent. Katie noticed our behavior and constantly edged us to tell her what happened. She pouted and put on her music to cheer us up. The only thing I could hear was the blood-curdling scream telling us to get out. Number two. My background. My dad is full-blooded Navajo from Northern Arizona, and my mom is white. I grew up in SoCal, but grew up going to the res every year and eventually moved and worked there. I'm not a skinwalker expert by any means, but I'll share what I know. The first experience I had was on one of my first solo trips without my parents. Out to our ranch on the reservation. I went with my cousin and a few friends. Our ranch is pretty much in the middle of nowhere, the nearest people being at the very closest 10 miles away, so you're pretty much on your own. Our first night out there, we arrived around 2 a.m., and there was no moon, and it was pitch black, so we had a hard time finding our hogan, a traditional octagon-shaped Navajo house. We decided to just camp near a cattle corral, which we found. We set up tents and knocked out until the sun came up. When I woke up, I took a little walk around our campsite and found coyote tracks which encircled our camp and actually got pretty close to the tents and campfire, which was pretty weird and a bad sign for several reasons. The rest of the day went without incident. We woke up, cooked breakfast, explored the rim of the Grand Canyon on the reservation side, and checked out old hogans in the area. We stayed up partially late that night. We had been out exploring at night and four-wheeling off some road trails. It was around 2 or 3 a.m. We were driving up a rocky road that went up to a small canyon, so there was hills pretty high and steep on both sides of me. I was standing in the back of the truck with a spotlight. That was when I saw the first light. The best way to describe what I saw 
was the visual effect of when you're standing in a room and someone behind you takes a picture with a flash. There was a brief instant in which everything lit up behind me, but it was a dull orange reddish light. I turned around towards where it came from and shined the light around, but there was nothing there whatsoever. Just a bunch of rocks. We thought it was weird, but kept driving. Once on top of the hill, we stopped to look around and noticed the weird light again, but this time it was far away, at least several miles. It was the same color, but looked like a muzzle flash from a gun. I waited and waited to hear the gunshot, thinking it was people like us shooting at night. But it never came. Then we saw another flash, but this time it was several miles west, and a bit closer. Then another closer and closer, within a few minutes. We decided it was a little weird without talking about it, turned around and went to the Hogan this time. We didn't really talk about the lights for some reason, and we all settled down in the Hogan. There was myself, my cousin, and my two white friends. We talked for a while, and it was at that moment when everyone stops talking and everyone is just about to fall asleep when this happened. The door. There is only one door, a small wooden door which locks shut, shook violently as someone kicked the door as hard as they could. It was loud and strong enough to where you could hear the lock rattle and the door bounce back and rattle against the wooden frame. My friend shot up and said, what the hell was that? They had good reason to be alarmed. We were very far from anyone else and they knew that. It's extremely quiet out here, pretty much deafening silence, and you can hear when vehicles are approaching. I got out of bed, grabbed a shotgun, and told my cousin to get his rifle. I walked to the door, motioned for him to come over and said, you get left, I'll go right. I'm not really sure why, but I wasn't scared despite the obvious weirdness of what was going on. I ripped the door open and we both slipped out the door after one another and swept the area. Looked everywhere we could and went to the truck and got the spotlight and swept the area. Nothing. No footprints, no animals, nothing. We decided to send a message and shot some rounds off to scare, whatever it was, anyway. I think we were all kind of worried, but eventually went back to the Hogan and settled back in. Kind of joking about it to calm our nerves. Eventually, we all fell asleep, but I hid my nervousness, and my heart was still racing. It wasn't until everyone was quiet and asleep that I noticed a thumping. I heard it very faintly through the rock walls, and when I put my ear up to the wall, I heard it a lot better. It was a very rhythmic thumping sound, something very heavy, and timed the same every single thump. It sounded as if it was coming through the rock table that the Hogan sits on top of. I tried to rationalize it and told myself it was just the cows, and somehow managed to fall asleep. I woke up the next morning and we went to check the cows, which were about 10 miles away on the ranch and hadn't been anywhere near our Hogan last night. Several days later, I told my aunts about what happened. They told me that one of my Navajo grandparents who lived alone and out in the middle of nowhere had weird things happen too. The same night we had our door kicked, Someone had knocked on her door in the middle of the night. When she opened the door, there was no one there. My aunts think it was a skinwalker who was messing with me and my cousins because we're mixed. I had a lot of weird stuff happen when I was working there as an EMT as well. It was around 2008 in northern Arizona on a Navajo reservation just on the border of the Hopi reservation which oddly enough is inside the Navajo reservation. I was working as an EMT for the tribe and had just gotten my medical license a few weeks ago, and it was on one of my first shift where I wasn't third hand on the ambulance with two other EMTs. I was working night shift on a spring night. It was a little chilly, but, but not cold enough to need a jacket. The moon wasn't really out, so it was another dark night on the res. 
We were stationed outside the emergency department, working from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and responding to 911 calls. We got paged out for a man down call to the Hopi village with no other information. We usually asked assistance from the police department in securing the scene just because that's standard protocol. And a lot of times it's a nightmare call. There's a possibility of domestic violence or rowdy people. But as there's very few police present on the reservation, there were no police units available to respond with us. We were on our own. We responded code 2, lights but no sirens, and made our way to the village, which was only 10 minutes away. We arrived on scene and immediately saw the patient lying on the ground in the dirt in front of the house. It actually turned out to be a distant relative of mine somehow. I had never met or known him, but I think he was my cousin's distant uncle. He was breathing, but drunk and unconscious. He looked as though someone had either kicked him or stomped on his chest. Nothing required us to load and go, but we would transport him to the hospital to sober up and just to be safe. We checked in his house, found some drunks, might have been the people who assaulted him, and kicked them out. Now it was partially dark, and in the Hopi village, in that section, there were no street lights. The only lights we had were the big lights on the side of our ambulance, which cast a big circle of light around the unit. There weren't any porch lights either, so it was pretty dark aside from the ambulance area. What I first noticed was quite weird. A few residents came out of their houses, which was odd because it was 2 a.m. But this village is small, so I didn't think much of it. It was pretty eerie though, because they all stayed just on the outside of the line which the light made. I could tell that they were just neighbors, but they seemed reluctant to walk into the light. At first we arrived, there were lots of dogs barking, and all of the normal noises, birds, cars, bugs, etc. We were outside by the patient, just about to get him onto the stretcher when everything changed. Out of nowhere, there was an incredibly loud howling which pretty much sounded like a werewolf in a movie. It lasted for a good 15 seconds, long enough to make us freeze and look at each other. It sounded almost exactly like a wolf, but was odd because it sounded like a person doing a wolf call, but it was way too loud to be done by a person unless they were standing right next to us. You could actually feel the reverberate through your body. I had lived there for about a year at this point, so I wasn't super new, but new enough to where I looked at my partner with a, is this normal, look. Somehow he knew I was asking without verbalizing it, and shrugged while looking around nervously. I looked back around and all the people were gone in an instant. There was no one around whatsoever. You wouldn't have known that they were even there. Even the people we kicked out of the house were nowhere to be seen. And all of the normal noises were gone. All of the dogs immediately stopped barking, which usually doesn't happen. If anything, the opposite usually happens when there's a noise. Dogs go crazy. We took the sign of everyone getting out of there as a cue to get out. My partner said, let's get the hell out of here. And we loaded the patient and were driving out of the village, probably the fastest I've ever seen a non-crucial patient get transported. It wasn't until years later I moved away, I saw the Navajo Cops episode of The Howler, but I found it pretty interesting, considering the area that the episode was pretty far from where we were. Edit. I don't know if that was a skinwalker, or really what it was. Take it as you will. This is the story of my first encounter with an odd creature I grew to call Skinwalker. I didn't start calling them that until I came face to face with one a second time. I am now 17, but when this happened I was 9. At the time I lived in a very small town in Michigan called Stockbridge. The town lies outside of a semi-thick forest, and I've been told by my dad much of it was cut down. 
My house was on the outskirts of town, near the woods. There wasn't much to do in the town. There were no fun places to go, and I had no video games or TV. So me and my friend Jake would spend all of our time outside. Both our parents were comfortable with us being outside without supervision and let us do what we wanted. The day this story takes place was August or September and was already dusk. My dad agreed that Jake and I could take his dog for a walk in the woods as long as we didn't stay out too long. We had been walking a path which led to a creek and had been planning to turn back once we reached it. It was about 15 minutes away from the edge of the woods. We were 10 minutes into the walk and Jake's dog, Midnight, had begun sniffing everything in sight. He was a well-trained dog most of the time. We could walk with him through the woods without a leash. But before the walk, we had gotten him really excited and he still hadn't calmed down completely. A small animal saw Midnight and quickly ran back the way it came. Midnight, still a bit hyper, bolted after it, ignoring Jake's cries for it to come back. Jake and I ran after Midnight as fast as we could, but we soon lost the sight of him, and had only the noise of his barks to follow. The case lasted a few minutes until we caught up to Midnight. He had stopped to sniff at a tree. We took a few moments to catch our breaths before we turned to follow the path we had made crushing through the underbrush. Midnight was now walking happily beside us. We hadn't gone very far when Midnight stopped, sniffing the air. Once again, he had turned and ran into the foliage. This time, he wasn't wagging his tail or barking, just running. Again, we chased him, but he wasn't going that fast and kept slowing down, like he wanted us to follow him. We stopped at a small hill that overlooked a clearing. I remember this part perfectly. Midnight started to quiet growl, and his fur started to rise. I remember being confused, but I couldn't see anything. The noise of something moving reached my ears. As I looked in the direction of the noise, a deer crawled into the clearing. This deer crawled, not limped or walked, it crawled like a child. I remember being transfixed on the deer. I saw it had no tail, and its face and body was oddly human. Its eyes were a bit too wide, and its nose was a bit too short and pointed, and its ears were too circular. At one point, it got so close, I could see that around the pupils of its eyes were white. This is not normal for a deer. None of us made a sound, not even midnight, as it walked around the clearing. It must have seen us, but I guess it didn't give a damn, as long as we didn't disturb it. After walking around the clearing three times... It walked closer toward the middle. It slowly raised itself to be standing on all four legs. Once it did that, it stretched its front legs out for a few moments, like a cat. Once done stretching, it raised its front legs, kind of like a horse can. Unlike a horse, it raised until its back was straight and its arms fell to its side. Midnight started barking like someone was trying to kill him. He sounded angry and dangerous. This was not the first or last time I heard Midnight bark like that, and it didn't even cause me to look at him. Instead, I continued staring at the deer who was now staring back at us. Its eyes were wider than they had been, and it froze like a deer caught in the headlight of a car. After an unknown amount of time of Midnight's barking and the deer's staring, the deer turned and started to run on two legs through the woods. It ran like a man arms swinging slightly up and down, like a person can do. It was faster than anything I had ever seen, faster than any deer once it heard a gunshot. Minutes passed and we all just stood there, staring at the area where it ran. Soon, Jake turned to Midnight, who was now relaxed, and told him to walk with us. I remember leaving the clearing, but for the life of me I can't remember how we found the trail or exited the woods. Both of our parents were terribly angry with us. We had been in the woods for almost an hour, and by the time we got back, it was really dark out. We both told them what happened in the woods, but they said the deer must have been injured or something. Even at us insisting that the deer stood up, they told us it was just our imaginations, and that there was nothing to worry about. Jake and I talked about a lot after that. 
We also talked about my second encounter when it happened. Sadly, I moved and lost contact with Jake. This is my second encounter with a skinwalker. This happened when I was 10, and unlike my first encounter, I do not remember much of the fine details such as time, date, or exact location. I do remember that this happened sometime in winter 2011 and took place in Canada. This happened when I was 10. I didn't know that skinwalkers were a thing at this point in time, and so my idea of skinwalkers and yours may be extremely different. My dad was thinking it would be cool, suggesting that the entire family take a trip up to Canada to visit his brother, my uncle. My mom shot that shit down immediately, as it was in the middle of winter and very cold. My dad, who can talk anyone into anything, anyone but my mom, got her to agree with him. After my dad talked some more, he was able to take only one child with him. He could take the eldest child, a boy of ten, me. My mom wouldn't agree to anything else. A week went by in which I assume my dad got everything sorted out with James, my uncle. My dad and I loaded into the car with our suitcases and started the multi-hour drive to our destination. This was my first time out of the country, and so I spent most of my time staring out the window. Before I knew it, we were stopping safely at our destination. We must have crossed through a border check at some point, but I don't remember it. Our destination turned out to be a cabin in the middle of the woods with no civilization for miles. It was fantastic. This remains the only time I visited Canada, but the woods were beautiful. I remember being awestruck by them. The trees were a different type than in Michigan. The nature was loud with animals, and there were some bird calls I couldn't place and the snow was deep but seemingly untouched. I met James and his family for the first time. The first three or four days were a blast, exploring my new surroundings and just having fun with others. My family isn't big on guns. Up until this point, I had never even seen one. My dad hesitantly said yes, believing his brother and his promise that he wouldn't actually let me shoot it. James got his gun, which was some kind of rifle, I believe and we went into the woods. I followed him as we walked, wondering what the gun would sound like. We hadn't gone far before we reached a fence that had cans on top of it. James showed me all the parts of the gun, even unloading it, so I could hold it. He showed me how to shoot, and I had a good time, even though I actually wasn't shooting at the cans. An hour went by, and it started to snow. At this point, James and I were cold, so we decided to start heading back. I don't know how close we were to the cabin when I saw it. Over some brush, I saw what I thought was a deer standing on its hind legs, walking like James and I were a moment before. I went running towards it, all of my memories of the previous years running deer flooding through my head. Running deer was what Jake and I started calling it, thinking that it was a name that fit the creature well. James saw me running and must have seen what I was running towards. It was massive, bigger than a deer by at least a foot and a half. He quickly caught up with me and put his hand in front of me to stop me from going any closer. We just watched it for a bit. At first it had its back turned to us, and I could see it didn't have a tail. After a few moments it noticed us and turned around. Its face was unlike the deer's, ears too round, nose too short and pointed, and its eyes too wide. Again I could see the whites of its eyes. Other than that, the face was completely different from the deer's. For one, it was a moose, not a deer. Those two animals don't look much alike. For another, it looked surprised. The deer had seen us, but no emotion at all ever crossed its face. Not even when midnight had started barking. But the moose looked shocked. It looked like it had found an unknown creature. I watched the moose with curiosity and wonder. The moose looked at us with something in its eyes. I couldn't place it at the time. Years later, I was 12. I saw the same look in another creature's eye. The creature was a starving dog, guarding its kill from me as I walked by. That look was hunger. The moose started walking toward us. It didn't get three steps before I heard a gunshot. Immediately after the gun was fired, the tree directly behind the moose seemingly exploded. Without a moment's hesitation, the moose turned and ran, 
faster than anything that size should be able to move. I didn't watch it as it ran. I had fallen over, ears ringing. I had been wearing earmuffs while James was shooting earlier, but I had taken them off while we were walking back. The ringing gave way to a splitting headache. I have never been so close to a gun when it fired. I have heard that being close to a gun when fired can leave you close to death for a while. But the ringing seemed to wear off after a few minutes. James was in front of me when he shot, maybe that had something to do with it. Anyway, once it was evident that my hearing was back, James made me promise not to tell anyone anything that just happened. Me being 10, I told my dad, James and I saw a moose, and it was standing just like a man, just like the deer. As soon as I got back, James was standing right behind me and everything. I remember James saying something like, This kid's got one hell of an imagination. And my dad just started laughing. I have tried talking to James about this. I tried just before writing this, in fact. But he always seems to avoid the subject. He even went as far as to hang up on me when I tried pushing for information earlier. This is my third story. At the time, I was 16 and lived in Massachusetts. I've also lived in Michigan and Wisconsin and have had encounters in both. I live near Boston, but was going on a road trip with my friend and his family out to their new place in the remote parts of Massachusetts. I'll call my friend Chad. We got to their house and I was planning to stay for about a week to help them get settled in and to see the surrounding area. At the edge of their property, they have these woods, which start off with just a few trees here and there, but after a five minute walk, it gets really dense. On the third day of being there, Chad's mom says she wants to give me and Chad a day off, so we could do whatever we wanted. At first, we wandered around the property and hung around the house. Then we choose to walk to the closest town. This takes 30 minutes. The town is small and there isn't much to do but I'm happy just to be back in a place like I lived for most of my life. Small and in the middle of nowhere. We talked to an owner of an ice cream shop which told us a bit of history about the town. Nothing important or exciting. After that, we had started back to Chad's house. We got back around noon and I suggested we go for a walk in the woods. Chad, who isn't the outdoorsy type, said no. But after a couple minutes of me nagging him, he agreed to go. Even though I go out all the time, I camp and walk the trails at night most of the time. I have gotten paranoid due to skinwalkers and other stuff, so I always have a pocket knife with me when I go out like this. So I ran inside the house to get it. We started into the woods, leaving an obvious trail. Like I said, the woods were very thick. At first, Chad spends his time grumbling things like, there's too many bugs, it's too damn warm outside to be doing things. Keep in mind, this was the last month in October. After a while, he started to enjoy being outside, and he actually says he liked it, and wanted to go further into the woods. By now, it was 4.30, and it was rapidly getting dark, but I didn't really care that much. We kept walking into the dark, to the point where I couldn't see much. We had started on our way back, but at some point we had gotten separated. I noticed this and turned on the flashlight on my phone, Spinning around to see if I could see Chad. I couldn't. Chad! I yelled out. Can you hear me? If you can, say something. I waited, and a few moments later, off to my right, I heard a feeble stammer. Zack. Zack is my name. It sounded like Chad, and I quickly turned to the direction of the noise and slowly walked towards it. I didn't see anything, so I moved my light horizontally to try to spot anything. I called out again, Chad, and got Zack again. It was much stronger and louder this time. I walked forward with more confidence but stopped dead in my tracks as I heard something big move very quickly through the bush right behind me. I whipped around frantically and came face to face with Chad. At first I was stunned. I mean I had heard him from the opposite direction. Up to this point in my life, I had only encountered a skinwalker with another person once and we were together when it happened. So this situation was new to me. What the hell? What the hell were you doing behind me? Why didn't you come from the same direction as your voice? I practically yelled at him, overcome by anger at being tricked like that. What are you talking about? You were the one changing directions. 
Chad yelled back. What? I said quietly. I shined my light on him. I could see he was obviously shaken. I heard you call my name and I started to walk toward you. You sounded scared or hurt at first, but after a few minutes you started saying my name normally. Then you stopped answering my calls and I heard you from behind me and I saw your light. So I started running at you, he explained. I was scared, finally putting the pieces together. I had never encountered a skinwalker that could impersonate a person's voice before, and I realized it was in the woods with us. There was a faint noise of movement behind me. I turned around to see a horrible sight. Not ten feet in front of me, its head looked like a wolf's, like the kind you would see at a zoo. It was at least six and a half feet tall. Its head, shoulders, and arms and chest were all covered in thick gray and white fur. Its legs and most of its stomach held a much thinner pelt of the same fur. Both Chad and I saw the creature and ran faster than I thought we could. For whatever reason, the creature didn't chase us and we made it out of the woods without incident. Chad told his family, who didn't believe him. I didn't tell mine because they haven't believed me about this stuff in the past. Chad has not gone back to the woods and has not seen the beast again. I haven't thought about this in a good 10 years since it happened. I'll start at the beginning. My family moved to secluded Pennsylvania when I was four. I was immediately entranced with living in the country, with several acres of woods behind us, and the house seemed so huge to me at the time. However, as a kid, I was always sensitive to spirits or energy and there were definitely some creepy things going on in the house. So my parents noticed that I stayed with our dog Bambi a lot. He was a small sheepdog and my adventure buddy when we went walking in the woods. In case you're questioning my parents, they trusted me, as young as age seven, to walk around alone as long as I was with my dog, as he was very protective of me my dad would give me his cell phone to carry with me just in case I needed any help. Up until I was 15, I spent a lot of time alone by choice. After school, I'd be home by 3.20. I'd eat lunch immediately and take Bambi out into the woods, and we'd explore the surrounding forests, fields, meadows, and ponds together. He was always right by my side and seemed really attuned to the spirit. If I felt something was in the house, he'd bark at it, or whine, or I'd watch him follow it around. Usually, he picked up on the presence of something at the same time I would. Anyway, from the backyard to the left, there is a small strip of trees, and in the fall and winter, when the branches are bare, you can see the field next door which is about 300 yards from my house itself. There is a big plane shed up there, and a kind of runway, where my neighbor would fly his biplanes off. What's kind of important to the story is we have no neighbors for a mile in every direction. It's pretty rare to see any kind of people on the surrounding properties, unless it's my neighbor haying the fields in the summer. But one day, in early fall, I had been trumping through the woods with Bambi for several hours, and I let him run off the leash most of the time, because he would run ahead about 20 feet and keep turning around to check if I was still there. If I had lost sight of him, he'd retrace his steps to find me again. That day, I got caught up in something, so Bambi ran off a little bit and I suddenly realized I was alone. Suddenly, there was a lot of crashing deeper in the woods and I heard Bambi's alarm bark and a lot of yelping and then some screeching. Raccoons and gophers really make fucking scary distress sounds, so I figured that's what it was. So I called Bambi and he popped out of some brush covered in pickers, and since I was spooked, I ran right back home with him. Right as I got back to the door, I stopped to catch my breath and Bambi and I were just standing there when I spotted something standing on the very edge of the runway, it ran along the higher end of the field, and then there was a steep drop off the edge of the hill at the very end of it. 
They didn't appear to be wearing anything distinctive, but even at dusk, I could see that they were appearing completely black, or everything about them was very shadowy and dark. This part gives me shivers now. They were standing, facing off the runway, and then I saw them hunch over and slowly raise their head and yell, Bambi, at the same high voice I would use to call him. They had the same vocal inflection as me too, but it sounded like they were trying really hard to sound like me. Next to me, Bambi tucked his tail under, lowered his head, and growled softly. They called again, but this time it sounded like they were losing their voice, as if they had been calling it for a while. My eight-year-old logic assumed that someone was trying to steal my dog, but why would they stand in the middle of the field? and be so obvious about it. When I told my parents about it that night, they dismissed my story. The next day, I went to my cousin's house two miles up the road, and my uncle told me about an animal he saw the night before that he was trying to identify. He said it looked like an emaciated cow sprinting across the bridge over the creek, which was about 300 yards from the runway. And also since then, Anyone who's been at my house has always been uneasy around the creek and the plain shed runway, whether or not they're interested at all in the paranormal. I know a lot of death happens in nature, but I've also found goats ripped up in the field. The nearest house with any amount of goats or farm animals is nearly four miles away, and a lot of unexplained things have happened up there. Number two, background. I'm a female and this occurred two years ago when I was 18. This takes place in Maine. Every summer, my family and I go up to camp in Ellsworth, Maine. It's about a three hour drive from my house. The camp itself is an hour from the nearest town. I've been going to this camp my entire life. My family owns it and have never had an incident like this happen before. I was watching TV in the middle of the night. Both of my brothers and parents had gone to bed. I had heard a noise coming from the kitchen and realized the dogs needed to go outside to do their business. So I took my brother's two pit bulls and my tiny dog outside after turning on the porch light. I walked around the front yard and let the dogs off the leash. It's so incredibly dark in the woods in Maine that the porch light really only illuminated the porch and nothing else. So I tried to keep an eye on them. I was momentarily distracted when I saw a wild bird on the lake. When I looked back, I saw the pit bulls were both looking at something in the woods. I couldn't see what it was, but I assumed they'd seen a squirrel or a raccoon. It was then I realized I didn't see Alfie anywhere. She's an awfully small dog, and she's completely black. I called her a few times, and heard a soft whimpering right where the dogs had been looking earlier. I took a couple steps in that direction and called for her again, worried that she may have gotten her paw stuck between rocks or gotten stuck in a snake hole. Suddenly, I felt something moving behind me. I whipped around and looked down, and it, it was Alfie. She had been staying close to me the entire time. I just hadn't seen her. So naturally, I was thinking, if Alfie's here, what the fuck is in the woods? I took another step forward, and the pit bulls began to growl. They were slowly advancing, and were now on either side of me, looking right into the blackness of the woods. I quickly picked up Alfie and began to back up, very slowly. I'm not sure what I thought was there, but there's a lot of animals in Maine, and I figured the dogs knew better than I did, since I couldn't see anything. Right as I turned around, I heard the most absolutely bone-chilling thing I have ever heard in my life. Coming from the direction of the woods, I heard someone, or something, call Alfie's name. It sounded almost as if it was trying to mimic me, but it was just all wrong. The voice sounded really distorted 
and almost seemed to wail. I freaked the fuck out and ran inside with the dogs. I have no idea what was out there in the woods. My camp is essentially a log cabin overlooking a lake, and our nearest neighbor, who is also family, lives at least a half a mile in the opposite direction of where that thing was. So, I decided to join my best friend Karen for a three-day stay at her grandmother's place on the reservation. Her grandmother lives near a place called Tuba City, Arizona, in the middle of nowhere but surrounded by secluded homes. We go to college together and I was kind of interested to know about Navajo tradition. The first day we stayed, it was pretty chill, nothing out of the ordinary, but then her grandma, not old, around 65, said that a stray dog came out of nowhere and wouldn't leave. To me, it acted kind of strange and ugly looking. Black, shaggy coat looked like a mix between a German Shepherd and a lab. That night, we were watching a movie in the living room. We had big windows that looked out into the front where the cars were parked with the curtains wide open. Grandma was in the kitchen cooking dinner and we were watching a movie. Next to the window is a medium bookshelf and where we keep our DVDs. Karen went to put back a DVD we had just watched, but she freaked out because that stray black dog was staring at us through the window, standing on top of the wood box outside. Not something normal dogs do, from my point of view, or hers. Usually, my dog, which is a house dog, scratches the door to be let in. Reservation dogs aren't house dogs, and dogs inside houses are frowned upon in Navajo tradition, meant to protect the house and the owner. The other dogs seemed to stray away from it. Karen opened the door and yelled at it to get off the box. It ran off behind the shed. We went to Tuba City to get some groceries and came back to the house. The dog was nowhere to be seen, nothing unusual. Grandma went to visit some people, so it was just Karen and I. About five o'clock, we heard someone trying to open the door. We both looked out since there had been no car heard and no dogs barking. We looked out the living room window to the door and there was a dog trying to open the door with its paws. Two paws wrapped around the brass doorknob, standing on its hind legs. I thought that was weird, but it didn't really freak me out. Karen was, though. She opened the door and chased it off. Grandma came back later and Karen told her she didn't like what she heard. We got ready to sleep. We slept in the spare room since it had two beds. One of the window curtains opened a little. We turned off the light, but something sounded like it was on top of the roof. Pitter-patter, footsteps and scratching sounds, as well as panting. Weird, because the roof was way up there. It sounded like it jumped off onto a large plastic water barrel that they had. At first, we heard what sounded like barking, but as it grew louder, the dog seemed to be barking at something else. But all of a sudden, something was running around the house, barking, and it was no dog. No, it wasn't. The barking sounded human, a deep male voice barking like it knew that we knew it wasn't a dog. Woof, 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 rough, rough, arf, arf. Just exactly like that, adding the W's, R's, and A's. Then panting again by the window, and we started freaking out. Karen decided to open the curtains to look out, in my opinion, that was stupid. There was a stray dog on its hind legs looking into our bedroom, but this time it stunk. And what I thought were two black holes in the neck 
Another pair of eyes twinkled. Think of those ugly, glossy spider eyes staring at you. And the paws were deformed, looking like hands and overgrown, somewhat thick, sharp fingernails. Again, both screaming and shutting the curtains closed. Grandma came running through the door, and seeing it, first thing she did was grab ashes from the fireplace, loaded three bullets into a shotgun from under her bed, blessed herself in Navajo, and went outside to shoot it, yelling in Navajo about how the thing wasn't welcomed here, and how it should get the hell out, and for it to go linger somewhere else. Them both being traditional, the next day they called a medicine man to come over and put cedar in the house. He prayed over everyone with cedar smoke and an eagle feather, blessed the place, and made us eat bitter herbs called eagle's gull or something, and gave me an old arrowhead. Apparently, I needed to carry one for protection and a little pouch called a corn pole in. Seems to work pretty well. The medicine man said the dog was a skinwalker, which in Navajo is a long word, but I just call them Yoshis. The body of a stray dog, which was killed by the skinwalker, made an illusion, so he wouldn't know that it wasn't a real dog. He also said that skinwalkers tend to harm people by using some sort of human bone, straw, to spit at someone and get human bones into them. Doctors can't detect it, but the medicine man that day pulled a piece of a human skull out of my grandma's right shoulder, pretty big, about two inches long and one centimeter thick. It was real because we watched him pull it out of her. That was intense. So, I lived in my parents' rental house near my school. It was kind of an intermediate form of living on my own. All the perks, not as many responsibilities. They wanted me to worry about school rather than bills, is how they put it. I still have a part-time job for groceries and other various stuff I want, though. The night it happened, I'd come home to a crazy dog, Vinny. My big black lab was going absolutely bonkers. He was jumping up on me, which he never does and barely let me get to the counter to set down my takeout. I figured he was out of water or excited for dinner. It was close to dinner time, and I paused to scruff him and calm him down, but he just kept bounding around like he wanted to tell me something. I fell his bowl and took my Thai food to the couch. I put on my favorite show and settle in. I had a paper to write, but was putting it off for a while. It was for my American film as a lecture class, which was important for my comparative lecture major, but I wasn't thrilled to write the paper on Native Son. So it was probably going to be a late night for me as I was inevitably going to put it off until late. Vinny came bounding in the living room and stood in front of the television. I stared at him for a moment as he panted furiously and started barking at me. I was quick to hush him because he has a big bark and we had neighbors, but he kept stalking around the living room, making various dog noises, whining and pawing at the carpet. I put my book down and went to give him more food just to shut him up, but his bowl was untouched. He never left so much as a kibble behind, and I became very apprehensive. He was acting like something was wrong. And he wasn't a drama queen, so I made sure all of the doors were locked and turned on some lights. Go outside, Vinny, I said, sitting back on the couch. He whined at me, and I had to get up to pull him by the collar to get him to the dog door to the backyard. He shot me a look and climbed through, and I sighed. Still a bit concerned, but not overly so. I went back to the living room and resumed my dinner. After a good five episodes or so, I got enough inspiration to go into the computer room and start writing my paper. There was a thump from outside as I sat down, but I ignored it. Vinny could get crazy sometimes and bounced all over the place, so I directed my attention to my homework and slowly got going. 
I had been working for an hour or so when I heard another thump and something drag along the side of the house. I furrowed my brow and tried to concentrate on my paper, but something felt off. Vinny started barking and I rushed to the door to get him to come in. He was growling, hackles fully up, and I could barely get him back inside. I locked the dog door and tried to walk away, but he just sat there, staring at it, still growling. I cautiously grabbed his collar and opened the door. The yard looked normal, kind of sickly in the outdoor lights, but otherwise just fine. Vinny jerked against me and it took all I had to keep control of him. He started barking again and I had had enough. We were going inside for the night. I made sure all of the doors were locked and the garage was closed. Something was definitely off and I decided to finally call the police on the non-emergency number. Hi, my dog is acting really weird and I've heard some noises outside. Is there any way you could have someone drive by my house? I asked. Of course, the woman said. What's your address? I told her my address and thanked her profusely. Vinny was still acting like a nutcase, but I didn't want him to go outside anymore. I felt better with him going crazy inside where he could protect me. Vinny is a big dog, fiercely protective and really scary when he wants to be. I had a boyfriend try to hit me once and Vinny nearly bit his arm off. He may have been acting like a manic, but if something happened, he'd have my back. I sat back down at the computer and the measly 400 words I'd managed to write and listen to Venny bark at the door. I was going to go crazy and I had no real way to shut him up. I considered locking him in his crate, but I was too on edge. There was a knock at the door and I nearly jumped out of my skin. Vinny started barking his head off, and I grabbed his collar again so I could open the door. Two policemen stood on my porch. We just wanted to let you know everything looks okay from the street, the first said, looking a bit nervous as I held the bouncing, growling beast by my collar. Did you want us to check around back for you? Oh my gosh, would you? I asked, relieved. That would be wonderful, right through here, I said, showing them to the back door. They went out and walked around the lawn for a few minutes and then came back in. It doesn't look like you have anything amiss, the other cop said, but we'll drive by later. Thank you, I really appreciate it, I said, showing them out. I locked the door and let go of Vinny's collar. He ran into the other room to bark at the door again. Part of me wanted to go unlock it, but something told me not to. I finally had enough and put him in the laundry room with his bed and toys, hoping he'd just lie down and go to sleep. But he just kept barking and howling. It was muffled now, though, which made it easier to concentrate on my homework. After what seemed like hours, I clicked the double space option and exhaled proudly, just barely making the page number requirement. That deserves some ice cream, for sure. I let Vinny out and scooped myself a bowl and made my way upstairs to get ready for bed. Vinny usually comes with me and sleeps in my bed, but stood at the bottom of the stairs, whining, giving me a little bark. I called him, but he just stood there, panting. I was really unnerved, but left my door open so he could come to bed when he calmed down. I ate my ice cream and read a few chapters in my book, then snuggled in for the night. I don't think I'd even fallen asleep when Vinny just went nuts downstairs. I was out of bed in a flash. He sounded like he was dying or something. On my way downstairs, I heard a loud clatter and a high-pitched scream from Vinny. I found him growling, barking, whining and snarling in the kitchen doorway, fixated on something. I ran to his side to calm him down and that's when I saw it. The dog door was halfway across the kitchen, lying limp on the tile and something was trying to come through the hole. The thing was, it was somewhere between one of those gray aliens and a corpse. It had one shoulder and a long, oddly jointed arm claw on the floor, and it struggled to get its other shoulder through. Its skin was somewhere between pale blue and mold green, like dead flesh. The hand that was clawing at the kitchen floor was too long, like it had extra joints in its fingers which were tipped with ugly little black claws instead of fingernails. 
Its face was stretched, its jaw hanging lower than it should, in a mewling, groaning, angry moan. It didn't seem to have eyes, just sunken, black, empty sockets. It started to wiggle its other shoulder through the door, and I didn't need to see any more. I pulled Vinny into the garage, not bothering with shoes or pants. I sped to my parents' house, running a few lights along the way. I told my parents what happened, but they didn't believe me, obviously. They did comment on how agitated Vinny was, though. I didn't sleep a wink that night, and I didn't go to school the next morning, opting to play sick and cuddle with Vinny all day. He'd calmed down, and that alone made me feel safe. When my parents went back to the rental house, they found the dog door halfway across the kitchen floor, and half of the backyard torn up. Claw marks were dug into the floor by the door, which they blamed on Vinny, but agreed that the situation was weird. I moved back into my parents' house and insisted they come with me to pack up my stuff. I wouldn't stay past dark, either. It's all I can do to stay in school. I'm getting Vinny licensed as a therapy dog, so he can come with me everywhere I go. I don't think anything like what happened that night will happen again, but if it does, Vinny has my back.